Okay, hey everybody. My name is Dan, and uh, work out here at the biochar facility at Living Wood Farms. This is uh, you guys familiar with biochar? It's a charcoal. It's used in the soil. It's a soil amendment. So that's what we do here. We make biochar every day. Take waste wood and process it into the charcoal and. Our equipment, as you see, is made almost entirely out of steel and fire brick and insulation, and it's a constant issue of maintenance for us. We're welding every day out here, and we, you know, because we're welding, we're doing all kinds of fun projects on the side, and we're maintaining the equipment, and it is absolutely essential to what we do, and we realize that as we're doing all these workshops, and um, talking about making biochar, talking about making cook stoves over here, which we're going to be getting into next month. You know, that all comes back to welding. That's something that we do so often out here that we take it for granted. Now, it's, you know, you can make biochar without welding. It's going to be a little bit harder to make the equipment um, airtight, which is usually a, a fundamental part of the biochar batch killing machines. Same with these cook stoves. You can make them out of tin cans. You can cut them with tin snips and bend it around and do that. But it's going to be harder to get something that's durable, long-lasting. Um, welding is just going to be something that can take you to the next level when you're doing those kind of projects or you want to get into something else at home. Um, simple repairs. I know Jackson Steel, these guys over in Hendersonville right now, not to rag on them, but they don't even take repair work anymore. They're that busy. You know, there's some other guys over here in Asheville that are six weeks out. Um, you know, so what if you've got something on your tractor or just a, say your bucket's got a little crack in it, now you can't use it. It's just one of those things. Welding is so easy, and it's so easy to be mystified by the whole process. We're going to show you today that um, at least getting two things to stick is, uh, is where we're going to get. <laughs> You know, so I'm not even going to call myself a welder. I'm going to call myself who, uh, you know, somebody who runs a welding machine. I'm certainly no professional at this, but I have been doing it for a while, and we've made it work for a while. Um, we're not welding gas pipes. We're not um, doing TIG welding. I'm not welding any pressurized tanks, none of that stuff. But I am building all kinds of crazy fun contraptions and making our biochar machines keep ticking. So. These are my um, partners here, um, Evan Morrow, he's been with us uh, almost a year now. And Johnny's been with us probably two and a half, two years. Yeah. So um, we are going to talk about basic concepts first of just working with metals, predominantly steel, because we're not really welding anything else besides steel. And we're going to talk a little bit about cutting techniques, a whole lot about safety. We're going to talk about two types of welding that are most common and the most effective for anybody who's doing anything at home or on the farm. MIG welding and stick welding. So stick welding is when you've got the long, this is kind of the original welding. If you think of it that way, back in the 50s, everybody was running stick welders. They're the, it, the large, usually a larger case and then it's got the long stick. Um, Johnny will show you here in a second. So what we'll be doing is, is talking about working with metals, and then we're going to break up into little groups. Evan's going to talk to everybody about stick welding. Johnny's going to just keep going over cutting and preparation, which is half of the job. And I'll be over here in the other side of that wall doing <coughs> MIG welding. So you know, when we break, we'll three groups, move around. We got some safety gear if you guys want it, earplugs. What Johnny's going to be doing is really loud. Absolutely have to wear safety glasses around them. It's up to you if you want to wear earplugs. Um, and we've got uh, welding hoods. You've probably seen welders who have the big, huge helmet on. We've got one spare each. So I'll be using one on the MIG welder, and if somebody wants to come up close and watch, kind of lean in a little bit, you can. Don't lean in too close. <laughs> Um, and same with Evan, he'll have a spare over there too if you want to actually see the welding process as it's happening. Um, so um, again, what we're not going to talk about is anything advanced. I'm not advanced, so I'm not going to pretend like I can talk about anything advanced, stuff you don't need to know. TIG welding, um, if you've ever heard of TIG welding, it's, a, it's, a, it's usually the guys are using it for um, 
welding pipes, tanks. It's when you can do something incredibly clean. They're beautiful looking welds. We just don't know how to do that. And we don't really ever have an application where we need to. And aluminum welding. Both of us have the capacity to do aluminum welding. My MIG welder needs a little bit extra work to make it weld aluminum. We could do that. Again, we're not gonna talk about it. Welding is actually a fusion of the metal. And I said we're gonna make things stick. What we actually do is, if you think of two separate pieces of metal actually being melted at the point of the weld. They're being melted together, and what we're doing is actually adding metal to it in order to help that happen. We're superheating this very local spot, and we're adding metal. It gets extremely hot right there at the arc. And uh, that is opposed to things like soldering. You know, if anybody, Richard did the class on soldering pipes. I don't know if anybody was out there, but it's taking two, you know, you're taking two similar metals, you know, brass and copper or something, or copper and copper, and then you're adding a completely different metal to it, something that usually melts at a really low temperature. You know, historically it was lead, now they're doing silver alloys. And um, again, uh, the difference there is that we're actually melting the parent material. It requires incredibly high control. You know, it's the welder that has the control there. The machine is, is making it easy for us to have incredibly high control. Um, when I say very local, I mean like I could actually weld something like this here. This is gonna be 6,000 degrees or something, I'm seeing, I mean incredibly hot. And I could probably for a minute, maybe still hold it over here in my bare hands. You know, so it's really local, it's incredibly hot. What happens there, if you're gonna take something right here and superheat it, a lot of times you're gonna get warpage of the metal because you know the metal is gonna change shape. That's something we think about all the time when we're welding anything that anybody else is gonna look at, you know, or something that needs to be straight in the, in the end. I'll show you a little bit about that. We'll do some MIG welding. I'll show you how easy it is to take a square piece of steel and it ends up being, a, you know, looking like that at the end of the day. What's really important, and Johnny's gonna go over it, is cleaning the actual piece that you're welding. You need to get down to bare metal almost every time. You know, there's a couple of times when you can take your stick welder and you can crank up the heat and you can blast through whatever's there, but you're gonna have a weld that looks like you didn't do your homework. But it'll stick sometimes if you're in a precarious spot. It happens to us all the time. You know, the stick is 12 inches long. You know, you can get up in there. So metals, I'm gonna run through some of this stuff pretty quick so we can get straight to demos. Um, who's done it before? Who's run a welder? Anybody here? I helped my father with a stick welder about a million years ago. So it's hard. You know stick welder's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's messy, too. It's messy. It's messy. Stick welder is what I think a lot of people learn on because it is so hard, but it's also really effective. Um, I'm going to show you how to shortcut that with the, the MIG welder. It's so easy. And the flux core welder is even easier, and they're cheap. Um, so I'm going to recommend that if anybody wants to try it, just try it, or you've got some little stuff you want to do around the house um, that you can usually get a little flux core welder, and I'll explain what that is, for $150. You can get a hood, helmet, you can probably get your whole setup for $200. And a lot of those little tiny welders are 120 volts, so they just plug in right into a regular outlet. You know, a good thing about them is you can run a huge extension cord. You know, it might need to be one of those heavier duty extension cords, but you can still run an extension cord to wherever you're welding. Like, we welded something on these gates a while ago, and, you know, it was crazy. We got all this really nice equipment, but we didn't have enough extension to get out there. We ended up taking our little, like, 40-pound, $150 welder out there and got the job done. And we made two things stick, and that's what we were trying to do. So, um, Definitely recommend getting into that. I ran one of those exclusively for the first six months of even working here. That's all we had. And I practiced at home. I did some art stuff around the house. It's the only thing I used for five years before I upgraded to a, to a MIG. Metals are all malleable, shiny. You guys know what metals are. They conduct electricity. Um, relatively high melting point. Uh, malleable meaning you can bend them easily. Might need a little extra negotiating with the 
torch or some heat or something. But um, there's pure elements, copper, tin. You guys know the periodic table. There's alloys, which are a mixture of those metals. And you almost never see anything that's a pure element in the store. It's very rare. I know some blacksmith guys who like to go and source um, wrought iron because it's like amazing to blacksmith with. They say it's like butter when it heats up and it has a, a little shine to it that it's almost like a self flux in. Well, it's so hard to find that stuff. You know, the only thing, the only people in the, in the world that still make it are Norwegians, I think, something like that. But anyway, point is, it's very hard to find anything that's not an alloy. Alloys are mysterious because you can't, from the surface, really tell what it is. For instance, this is, um, a file. We know that a file is an alloy of steel that's incredibly high carbon steel. And because it's high carbon, it's harder than other steels. So one thing that you can do if, you're, if you don't know what you got, is start with something really hard like a file and then see if you can scratch whatever you have. It's an easy test to see if you're working with like a mild steel or a high carbon steel. I'll let you kind of see it here. If I bear down a little bit, I can easily scratch that. All that's really telling me is that this is a softer metal than, uh, than this. It's important when you get into trying to bend it, heat it, work with it. Point is, it's kind of nice to know where you're starting from, at least with your alloys. Gold, you guys know you, you, nobody ever really does anything with pure gold, maybe in electronics or something, but the ring you're wearing is, is definitely not pure gold or can be crushed and you know, it's just way too soft. Um, brass is actually copper and zinc, bronze, copper and tin. Um, steel implies, is iron that has varying degrees of carbon. Like I said, the mild steel, you know, it's like nails, things that bend really easily. Like you're, you're gonna hammer a nail, it's gonna bend. If I hammered that file, it would break like glass. Okay, that's the difference between mild and high carbon steel. Um, there's all kinds of different grades. Um, we like to work with mild steel. Generally, it's a lot easier for us. Unless we're doing some specialty applications, um, tools, axles, those are gonna be medium carbon steels. Um, some tools like a knife blade is gonna be mild at the edge and it's gonna be gradually hardened as you move towards the blade itself. So if you think about mild, is, is can be bent. It's tough, and the high carbon steels are going to be very brittle, but also very hard, and it allows you to have that cutting edge, and also the uh, you know the flexibility of working you know something that's not going to break if you bear down on it. You know, so that gets into a pretty uh, delicate process to actually take one single piece of steel and, and give it varying degrees of hardness. Cast iron is very brittle low, relatively low mel melting point. Um, stick with us, hopefully in January, we're gonna show you how to do a little cast iron. That's, uh, that's our goal. Um, we'll see. <laughs> um, we'll at least show you how to cast aluminum. Um, stainless, 10% uh, chromium. You guys know stainless steel, is entirely different beast. Um, you know, sometimes you can get by making things stick with stainless. We do that all the time. Definitely much better to have a stainless filler metal. Um, Evan can show you how to do that with the stick welder. Um, different materials, different melting points. You guys know lead melts very low, like I said, in soldering. Aluminum 1218, that's a pretty easy temperature for us to attain with our oil burner that we've been working on lately. Um, so we know we'll be casting aluminum, playing around with that. Cast iron, 2200. We might be able to do that, we'll see. Um, steel, 2500. Um, Again, working with steel, that requires a lot of heat. That requires a lot of energy. Um, smaller pieces obviously require less heat. Larger pieces, more heat. It takes a little time to let a larger piece warm up to where it's workable. Um, rapid cooling. This is getting back into that knife edge that I was talking about. If you cool it rapidly, you can actually harden the steel. And if you heat it up and you let it cool as slowly as possible, then you actually kind of rearrange the, the crystal structure of the steel and you kind of make it back to its like normal state. That's called annealing. 
And that's a process that works with low carbon steels. As you go up in the high carbon steel, you get into stainless, it's kind of a different animal. You can only work it so much before it becomes so brittle that it'll just break. Um, but if you get into pinch and you overwork a piece of steel, so you bend it too much, or you just kind of need to start over, annealing is a good thing to do. Heat it up, gradually cool it. Um, tempering is that process of, of dialing in that desired hardness and the desired softness. And I think it's pretty cool. If you look back to how fundamental this stuff used to be, you know, people say, oh, he's losing his temper. It probably means he's getting too hot. You know, so when you're working with this stuff, it's really easy to overheat a piece. If you take a knife and you hold it up, you know, to a, a lot of people will take a knife and heat it to sanitize it. Well, if you get it too hot, you're gonna lose the temper and it's been done this like soft, malleable thing that doesn't hold an edge anymore. That's why you don't overheat your knives. Stress hardening is what happens if you overwork a piece of steel. Now you can harden this, like I said, by heating it up and throwing it in a bucket of water. The blacksmith guys do that all the time. Or you can harden it by bending it. I've actually made that quite a bit harder right there than it is down on the tip, you know? And if I want to take that, it's going to get increasingly harder to bend that. And then it's going to actually warm up a little bit and it's going to break if I ever do it. And I can sit here and do this, or you guys just trust me that it's going to break. <laughs> You know, so you can actually feel, you can actually feel a little bit of heat right there at the tip that I just generated. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is all important. I know it seems like really esoteric concepts, but when you're actually working with the steel, these are gonna be these little mystery things that are gonna catch up to you if you don't at least have some familiarity with what happens to a piece of steel when you heat it and cool it. Finding steel, I'll just run through this again. Don't go to Lowe's or Home Depot. It's incredibly expensive if you buy steel there. It's like, you know, way more expensive. Go to a place like Jackson Steel. We love those guys. Um, there's some guys in Asheville, all kinds of places that will sell you steel. Mountain Steel down on Swan and River Road. They're gonna sell you steel. They're gonna prefer to sell you a full stick of steel, which is usually 20 feet. Um, it's a lot of steel and like, they know that most people can't carry a 20 foot stick. A lot of times, if you're just buying a little bit or if you're a new customer, um, they'll cut it for you. They might charge you a little bit if you have a bunch of cuts. But, um, you know, places I used to go, they would see that I drive up in my Subaru and they would just know right away. They're like, well, okay, what do you need cut? And then I could even say, okay, I need a four foot piece, an eight foot, this and this. And sometimes they do it. Sometimes for a few extra bucks, they'll do it. Um, but again, it's incredibly cheap, way cheaper. You'll find steel, if you're, you know, you're paying by weight. So if you're, you know, um, you can actually get something that looks pretty substantial um, that's just not that heavy. And, and you kind of, it's, you went out that way. Um, there's also the junkyard. We love the junkyard. Um, Bimco down in Asheville. Has anybody been to Bimco? Um, Billmore Iron Metal Company? Yeah. Yeah, that place is awesome. Definitely worth it. You should go to Bimco and walk around, and don't get in anybody's way because they're working there, but they still let you back there. If you sign a waiver, they'll let you back there and you can um, actually pick your own steel and pay for it by weight. And it's really cheap to do it that way. A lot of times you're getting something that's all bendy, it's mystery, you don't sometimes know what it even is. That's why it's good to carry your file with you so you can scratch it or carry a magnet with you. You know, some stuff's magnetic. Stainless steel is not magnetic. Um, so if you're carrying a little magnet, you can test it and make sure it is what you want it to be. Um, take a file and rub the file across it. See how soft it is. You know, it's, that stuff is so dirty sometimes, but it's a win because it's incredibly cheap. Um, what, I think it was something, I forget, and it's, it's either, they'll give you $30 for 100 pounds, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what it's going right now. So that's really cheap. Um, if you're lucky, you can also find machine parts and fun stuff there that you can pay. You know, I think that's 30 cents a pound for, um, which, you, I mean, it's a steal sometimes. Anyway, going in the junkyard, wear your boots. Don't show up in flip-flops. Um, wear your boots if you're going to do any welding at all. Wear your gloves. Wear your safety glasses. 
earplugs. You go into these old welding shops and there's, uh, you, you're gonna run into some old timer that's most certainly deaf. A whole lot of hazards in the welding shop. Every hazard you can imagine is probably in the welding shop. Um, cuts, you know, you're gonna cut the steel, it's gonna be a raw edge that you gotta prepare, kinda soften a little bit so you're not gonna cut yourself. That's one of the first things we do. When we cut, we take it with the grinder and we just kinda like smooth it out so we don't have burrs. Um, impaling, it's like actually a legitimate problem because if you've got steel stored up on a rack or something, it could fall, you could slip on the floor. Um, you know, some of you said, I think you said you've seen this place dirty before. You see how dirty it actually gets. And uh, um, it's, it's just dangerous, you know, clean shop, clean floor. Um, shrapnel, actually I said shrapnel, you think bomb, but when we use these little cutting wheels, sometimes they break and, and they'll, they'll blow up and they'll, they'll move out in this circular pattern. And you can learn to stay away from that stream of sparks. John will show you when he gets welded in. But um, just something, you know, wear tough clothes. Don't wear like, uh, you know, probably don't wear this t-shirt. <laughs> but um, UV burns, it's kind of a unique issue to weld in. Um, when you actually, when you're using that electric arc, it puts out a really intense, incredibly intense UV light. That's why we wear these big hoods. It's really to protect our eyes from that UV light. That's really important. That's like the number one thing about welding. And the number one thing, you guys need to know that when we start welding, you can't look at it. You can't even do this. You can't barely look at it. You have to kind of do this, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's why we've got the big hood so that if you want to get up close, you know, you can, hopefully you can see something um, wearing the hood. It's also gonna sunburn you. Um, you get incredibly bad sunburns if you don't take care of yourself. You'll see that I'm gonna put on a big heavy sweatshirt um, just to weld. And, and once I've got my gloves on, you'll see this is the only part of my skin that would be exposed, but it's gonna get sunburned if I'm doing this any more than 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, also your hood, sometimes I get sunburns right here because my hood will, or just won't completely cover my neck. You know, so just, Know that going into it. It's a unique thing, and you won't know it until it's too late. Um, eyes, again, obviously, protect your eyes. You don't even walk around here when somebody's doing any welding without protecting your eyes. Gases, you know, um, off gases when you're actually heating the steel, when you're welding, there's, you know, there's gas going into it, there's gases being created. Um, ventilate, obviously get some air movement of some sort or wear a really nice respirator. Um, especially when I'm working with that junkyard steel, you don't even know what it is. You don't know what's on it. Sometimes it's really dirty. It's got oils, whatever's in the dirt over there at the junkyard. It's got paint, you know, it could be lead paint. You don't know that. You don't know what it is. So just be really careful with breathing this stuff. Even running the grinders, you're gonna kick up little fine you know, when you're cutting with saw blade, you know, you see your sawdust on the floor, you don't realize how much is still airborne. It's the same way with metal. Um, there's airborne particles, probably more airborne particles of the disc itself, which is a ceramic material. Um, so just, again, protect yourself. Burns, I think that goes, to, you know, obviously. Protect yourself from burns. Um, your property. You know, it's easy to start welding. You'll see that stick welder. You said you've done stick welding, so you know about the little droplets of hot metal that are likely to land on the floor. Um, you know, protect your building. We're working right next to a kiln that we keep at 120 degrees sometimes during the day, full of wood. So, you know, obviously we're thinking about that all the time. We can't have a little ball of hot metal roll into the kiln or um, we got some, some real problems. Keep a fire extinguisher close by. And electrical ha um, hazards, you know, you're working pretty high current electricity. Um, I know a guy who used to work on boats, and this was the only time he's ever been shocked welding, was when he was actually standing in the water, like knee deep in the water, working on the hull of a boat or something. Um, so just be like, be careful, it's electricity, don't work around when it's wet. These welders are actually pretty safe. I, I've never been shocked by it. Um, but there's always the precautions to take. Don't stand in water and do it. You know, we wear nice boots with rubber insulated soles for what it's worth. Um, that keeps you from being grounded. You know, don't wear 
you don't go barefoot, you know, basically. Any questions before I hand it over to Johnny to talk about some prep work? I know that's a ton of information. I promise it'll make sense when you actually start seeing it in practice. Good? Cool. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, everybody. As Dan just said, I'm Johnny. Um, been here for about two and a half years. Thank you. Um, and I, I didn't even know how to weld before um, I worked here. Um, so Dan and another fellow that used to work here taught me everything I know. And YouTube is an awesome tool uh, that you can find a lot of useful information on, as I did when I was learning. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about preparatory measures, um, which there are a lot of when you're uh, welding. Um, because a lot of times, like Dan was saying, if you get a piece of metal from Bimco, it's been sitting out in the rain all, you know, for weeks or months, however long it's been. Uh, it's probably got a heavy, like, coat of rust on it. Um, and if you try and weld on that, you're going to get a terrible weld. It's not going to penetrate very well because that arc that's creating the heat isn't able to penetrate the, the metal and make, make good con electrical contact with that. Um, so there are a lot of different things you can do, um, like grinding that rust off. Um, and you're going to have to be cutting different pieces to the size that you're going to need for whatever project you're taking part in. That being said, um, there are some parallels between working with wood and working with metal. When you're working with wood, when you're like using a chop saw or something of the sort, a circular saw, when you cut into the wood, um, the wood comes off as sawdust. Um, and same thing as in metal, um, it, you're taking out a part of it, so you have to, when you're measuring, you have to account for that. But instead of sawdust, it's like really hot sparks that are coming off there. And uh, Sawdust can get in your eye and soak in these sparks, and they're a lot worse because they're really sharp. Um, I've had it happen before, it's not fun. <laughs> so you definitely want to wear a lot of protective equipment. Um, I actually wear goggles when I uh, do a lot of prep work to, so, because sometimes it'll bounce off something and come in like that little gap that's in your, in your glasses. So you really got to watch out for that. Um, and uh, just using these tools, this is an angle grinder. It's a really powerful tool. Um, and if you're not careful, it can get away from you and fly to your hand, hit your arm, and then in a second you have a pretty significant wound that you have to deal with. Um, and it's not a clean cut, it actually, it's like taking out material of your arm like it would for metal. So you got to make sure you have a firm grasp on it. Um, like Dan was saying, you want to keep it in a, an angle that the sparks are getting kicked out away from you. Your grinder dust is pretty harmful for you to breathe in. Um, so whenever I'm work, doing prep work, I uh, wear this respirator, which um, it has a particle filter on the outside and then um, a gas filter on the inside. And so that's what it looked like before. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of stuff that it's taken out. So uh, if you're gonna be doing any kind of prep work for an extended period of time, I definitely recommend uh, wearing some kind of a respirator. Um, okay. You should know that respirator is not nearly as expensive as it looks. That whole setup is probably, I want to say somewhere around $30. Yeah. And well worth that $30. Um, all right, so one of the tools. Uh, so this is your angle grinder. Um, you can, this is one of the most useful tools when you're working with metal. Um, you can do all, you can clean, you can cut, you can grind with it. Um, but it is pretty dangerous if not used properly. Um, and there's a lot of different attachments that come with it. So the one that's on here right now is a cutting wheel. Um, so this part wears on the metal and takes out about that width of metal as you're cutting. Um, for like cleaning or taking off paint, you're gonna wanna use something like this. Uh, it's called a cup brush. And that'll clean it right off for you. It give your metal a nice shine to it. And something similar to that, uh, this is called a flat disc. It has, it's like sandpaper on here, and it kind of does the same thing as, uh, as this um, cup wheel, but, or sorry, cup brush, uh, but it'll give it a nice polish. It's really good for like finishing off metal after you've worked on it. Um, and then this is your standard grinding wheel um, for like taking burrs off edges after you've cut it. Um, if you need, if you have like a nasty looking weld, um, you can use the grinding wheel to grind it down to the shape you like. And I, I use this tool probably more than any other tool here when working with metal. 
um, it's really it's like you can like I said you can do everything with it and I'm gonna go over a lot of other tools that make the process a little bit quicker and easier um, but if you're looking for looking to work with metal and just want to get the basics then this is something you're definitely gonna want to get and on to the bench grinder um, this is a very nice tool um, it's good for certain certain things so um, and it, it can be a lot safer than an angle grinder, obviously, because this one isn't, but usually they're mounted to a table or something like that, so it can't go flying anywhere. Um, and they have a little shelf on them right here, and this is obviously to keep sparks from flying up and hitting you. Um, and so the proper way to use a bench grinder, um, when you're using, you want to have whatever you're grinding flat against this shelf. Um, otherwise, if you're like if you're going like this, then the it's, the wheel's spinning this way, so I can take your material and just jam it in there, and bad things can happen. So you either want to have flat up against this, or if you're trying to sharpen it, like rest it on on this shelf and hit it on the grinder, kind of like that. With I'll, obviously with safety goggles and respirator, preferably at all times. And if you're gonna be working with metal, it's usually good to have like a cap, that's like a welding cap, because just in case the spark doesn't fly up and catch your beautiful hair on fire. <laughs> it would be fun. All right, so a bench grinder is nice. Uh, like, you could use it to sharpen a little stick. It's really good for, like, rounding corners on a square piece of metal. Um, and it's nice because since this is mounted, you can use both your hands and really um, be, like, dexterous with it and work it around however you want it. Whereas with an angle grinder, you have to either put it on a a clamp and like work around with that um, so it's good for like little small two hand pieces to round corners or sharpen edges and stuff like that all right and uh is anyone familiar with the porta band okay does everyone know what a bandsaw is okay it's ba it's a portable bandsaw that you can hold with one or two hands and it has a handle and two wheels and a you know your saw blade on it and it rotates around when you press the trigger and you just hold it and it's good for like cutting pipe any of the things I haven't actually personally used it too much um, but the nice thing about it is it's typically a lot safer than an angle grinder it doesn't shoot sparks out in every direction there aren't really any sparks at all um, it's like sawing through it the blade is really thin so it takes out less material um, and the next thing I'll talk about is this chop saw right here so this is a lot like your miter saw when cutting wood. Um, pretty much does all the same things. Um, it kicks out sparks this way. And the nice thing about the chop saw is um, you can make nice square cuts or to whatever angle you want. This one comes with a, an Allen key right here and you can loosen your fence up and change the angle of it so you can make miter cuts and it's a lot quicker than an grinder. You can get a lot square cut. Um, and it's, it's safer because you don't have to worry about this flying out of your hand either. Um, so it's a good tool to have. All right, and next thing we're gonna talk about is the plasma cutter, um, which, spin this around a little bit, is this guy right here. Um, and I remember when we first got this, it just, made our lives so much easier um especially working with like heavy metal like this quarter inch plate um a plasma cutter will take a fraction of the time uh, as a uh, a cutting wheel a lot and a lot less material um as far as cutting wheels go um and so how the plasma cutter works basically is uh it's kind of like a welder in that it uses an arc um so you have a grounding clamp and this would it's kind of like your electrode what creates the arc and so you'd clamp it to the piece that you're working on and then when you press the trigger it's also attached to compressed air and when you press the trigger it compressed air shoots out and then once it get up gets above the metal that you're cutting it creates an arc and the compressed air superheats that arc and it turns it to plasma and that superheated plasma is actually what cuts the metal. Um, so I could just 
it's it's like a like kind of like a lightsaber almost <laughs> but you have to be like right up on the material to use it and it's nice because you don't really have to clean it so if there's paint on it the heat uh, from the plasma will just vaporize the paint um, so I've it's good to wear respiratory respiratory safety items for this but yeah it takes a lot of the work out of it um, and afterwards this piece is actually been plasma a lot so if you can see the edge is like pretty smooth right there. And if you have a straight edge, you can just run it right along the straight edge and get a perfectly straight cut. Um, nice and smooth. And the only thing you have left over is like, is a little bit of slag on the backside. As it's like pushing through, it leaves a little bit of metal. And to get that off, um, what we do is just take a hammer and just tap it and it'll come right off. And then you can clean it up further with the grinder if you need to. Um, so that's, really handy but also really expensive so expect you to see it in someone's home workshop or anything um and then another cutting tool that we don't really use too often to have a plasma cutter but also cuts very efficiently is oxyacetylene torches um so and this works in a similar concept as the plasma cutter um, you have two different types of gases oxygen and acetylene uh, both flammable and you light it first with the acetylene and then you bring in the oxygen and um, you want to you want to make the flame come to like you want it white so it's super hot and it comes to a really tiny point and you have this trigger right here and when you're wanting to cut you press this and it shoots oxygen through through the nozzle um, kind of like if you, come, if you guys want to come and look at this after there's one hole in the middle and then several tiny holes around that middle hole. So oxygen shoots around it and this actually oxidizes the metal at a rapid rate and that's what um, causes it to re um, remove material. And the cuts look very similar to a plasma cutter um, and you can also do the same thing with a straight edge where you can get a nice straight cut by just laying it and keeping a really steady pace. So that's and you can also weld with these too, so it's a pretty, pretty useful setup to have. And you can take it wherever you want. I think that's about it. Does anyone have any questions about prep work? It is really important as if when you start to weld to find out if, if the point that you're trying to weld, like if I tried to weld this to something else, it would, just, it would look ugly, it would be splattering all over the place and you're not going to get a good weld, probably break really easy. Do you ever have to go to the point where you use chemicals to clean the metal? Sometimes I'll do that, you know, and if I want a certain look when I'm done. Um, like I've done some art projects where I'll find something that's it's like really rusty and, um, and instead of grinding it, I want it to I want it to have, it, when, it, when it's rusty and then you clean it, it, it gets like a little pitted look. And if you want to maintain that look, then you can use some sort of chemical treatment um, without having to grind it and polish it. And, and also, something I didn't go over, um, when you're welding like two pieces together, uh, depending on what angle they're gonna be, you wanna have space for that bead to, to lay in. Um, so if I was welding, you can kinda see it on here, like, these two pieces together and you want to make a burr in it so that the bead can kind of lay in there. You guys can see that's what, this is just a little burr cut in each, each side of the metal. So that bead lays right in there. All right, well I'll pass you guys off to Evan, thank you. Hello everybody, my name's Evan. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about stick welding. Stick welding uses an electrode, just like this one. This is a stainless steel electrode, uh, basically. You have your machine, and you have a grounding clamp, clamp to your uh, working piece, and you create a circuit through your welder and the electrode uh, with your piece, and you melt your work along with the electrode and fuses all together. Uh, so it's really hot. Surface prep is pretty important, really important like John said. And um, so 
This is your electrode. It's a just a stick of wire. Um, the electrode, different types have different wire um, and for different steels, different materials you're welding. And on the outside is uh, flux, that uh, not metal coating. And when you're welding, it vaporizes that flux, uh, creating a, an atmosphere, uh, an inert atmosphere, so that the molten metal will not uh, oxidize. So it's basically just a really clean, clean, uh, sterile environment for the molten uh, metal. Um, and then that, that flux vaporizes, it melts, and then it lands back on top of your bead, which is the metal that you're laying, the filler metal, the weld bead, lays on top of that, uh, it further keeps impurities out of the metal, out of the weld, and uh, it allows it to cool slower, uh, so it's stronger, well, not as brittle as if it cooled quickly. Yeah, there's different types of electrodes. Uh, the 6011 is the most common uh, mild steel electrode. It's fairly easy uh, to strike an arc, to get, get the arc uh, going. Um, you can do it in any position. Like some, some uh, uh, electrodes you can't like weld overhead or you can't weld vertically down. Uh, so you, you kind of have to do a little bit of research before you go and buy an electrode. But usually 6011 or 6013 electrode will pretty much cover any kind of mild steel uh, welding application with stick welding. But stick welding is getting more and more obsolete with uh, MIG welders. So might might be using one sometime. Here's a picture of types of welds. Um, let's see, I think some of them are displayed here. Um, basically, they're just different ways to join metals, uh, two pieces of metals together uh, in the way that you want. Uh, and this, the pictures show you uh, how you want to bevel your edges to lay a weld in there. Um, to basically to prep it and and where you put your weld. Um, and there's different ones on here. There's a corner weld, corner joint, T joint. Uh, this is a lap joint. And then just butt joints. Uh, stick welding is pretty hard to just jump into. It takes a lot of practice, uh, especially getting started. Like you have to strike the, the arc, and a lot of times the stick will just, just melt and just stick to the work and you won't it'll just be stuck and you'll have to yank it off or it'll just like heat heat up and burn the flux off the rod so it's pretty hard it, it's, it's hard to get the hang of but once you do it's pretty fun uh, and voltage is important if it's too high you're gonna burn holes through your metal if it's too low you're not gonna have enough penetration to properly hold your metals together um, the rods uh, the flux coating uh, it's it takes on moisture pretty easily, and when moisture gets in there, it's, it makes it really hard to weld, and sometimes you can't even weld. So you want to keep those in a sealed container, preferably like in your house or something where it's you know, controlled uh, environment, away from moisture. Does anyone have any questions? That was pretty quick. Um, this guy, he asked what the difference between a 6011 and 13 was. You won't get really good looking welds, uh, there's more splatter, but it's uh, the uh, the number. I can't remember if it's the, the 60 or the 11, uh, but the the steel has a stronger tensile strength in the 6013. Really, we've used the the stick welder. The main reason we use it around here is to weld stainless. It's set up to weld stainless, or if we need to weld something incredibly thick, we're talking like three eighths or something. If we're going to repair the tractor bucket, then we're probably going to use the stick welder. Everything else gets MIG welder treatment. Um, that kind of shows to the point, and, and honestly, if we wanted to repair the tractor bucket with the MIG welder, we could do that too. It would just take a lot more prep work. We're talking about scooping it out so that we can lay that weld way deeper in there and then build on top of it. And you can, you can repair heavy stuff. It's just more tedious with the MIG welder. Now the butt weld, I mean, you, you know, it goes to show something like this. If you just weld it, 
end to end, it's not going to be nearly as strong as if you overlap it and you weld on the inside and the outside. Any of these pressure tanks, like this old blue tank over here that somebody gave us, you know, we build all kinds of stuff with tanks. So it's like cylinders are really hard for us to do. So we always find cylinders if we need to make something that's a cylinder. But all those are going to be um, called double butt welded just so they can take pressure without breaking up and expanding. Um, that's really, the, you know, we don't really pay, honestly, a whole lot of attention to what type of weld we're doing. That's just something that's in every welding book. It's like on page one of every welding book, so we just thought we'd kind of throw it in here. But probably most importantly, when you're talking like how you weld it, like say you have that T-joint in the middle, and you see how it's only on one side? If you weld completely on that one side, like, okay, imagine this is what you're welding to, and then and you come up and you like, you have your T and you're only heating on this side, then it's gonna go like, what's it gonna do? Okay, it's gonna go out for a second while it's really hot, and then when it cools, it's gonna go and suck in, right? So if you're doing something like, you wanna stand something up straight, you gotta weld a little bit on this side, and then a little bit on this side, and a little bit on this side, and a little bit on this side, and let it cool in between, and um, that's probably, I think when you're looking at those joints, it's probably really the only take home that I think is important about what we're doing here. This is that $150 welder I was telling you about that is, uh, comes from somewhere on the planet. I don't know where they can make these for $150. This one was, I think this one was $90 actually. And it's pretty cheap. I'm not gonna say like, you know, if you're serious about it, you know, or you already know that you're gonna be serious about it, or you wanna build, you know, say a wrought iron fence for your house or whatever you're into, then you're probably gonna wanna go ahead and just buy something nice up front. Um, the Miller 180s are like, I don't know what they are now, $800, $700, something like that. Um, I got mine from a friend, but he was about to sell his on Craigslist for a hundred bucks. So um, it had something wrong with it. It was like a little transistor or something, but I just Googled the symptoms and it was like, I got a 30 cent part and I got a $800 welder for a hundred bucks. I'm just saying, so people are selling these things all the time. You don't have to go cheap up front if you um, don't want to, but it is a nice way to just kind of get your feet wet. Um, and that little 120 volt cord means a lot around your house if you're actually doing some stuff. When I first started out, I was, you know, um, I would unplug my dryer and, and have to move it out of the way and like run the dryer cord through my window, out around outside and into my garage. And it was just like one of these things that, that gets old really fast. So my philosophy, if you can do it with this, like, you know, don't be too proud, do it with this, it's great. Um, so Evan talked about electric arc weld in. That's all we're talking about here, is making a circuit with your ground clamp. Like if I want to weld to this, I'm going to ground my piece, okay? And then I'm going to take my gun here, or your stick electrode, and then you're actually going to come up here, and you're going to hold it up, and you're going to have to maintain a small gap from what you're welding. Like, uh, it, you might be quarter inch or eighth inch or three sixteenths or something. That number, don't be intimidated by that. It's like incredibly hard to maintain a perfect quarter inch the entire way. That's something you're only gonna learn to do with practice. Something I've, I don't do it. I mean, and I've been doing this for ages. Um, at least it feels like ages. Um, so this, again, our little cheapo welder, this is the flux core. Welder, did, um, did y'all understand what he says, uh, what Evan was talking about with flux? Is that something you're familiar with? You know what flux does? Okay, um, it creates that shielded environment where your superheated metal does not um, see oxygen. It's kind of hard to believe, but it actually rusts, like it's almost instantaneous how fast it would rust. Or scale over, scaling is a function of rusting which like a really thin layer of steel actually, of scale, burnt steel. Um, 
I'm actually not totally positive that's burnt steel, but it looks like it. I'll show you. It actually puts a thin layer of that over the top of what you're welding, and you're not actually penetrating that burnt area of steel. You need flux. You're not going to be able to get away with any kind of welding if you're not using flux. It's not actually going to weld. You might get something to stick, but as soon as you like bear down on it, it's going to break off. So there's two types of, you know, we call it MIG welding. Technically, it's just wire welding. But all this thing does is you clamp onto your piece, and then when you press that little trigger and you turn the power on, it feeds this little spool of wire down through this long tube. You know, this tube is just a conduit that allows that little spool of wire to come out the very tip. Um, you see that little tip of wire hanging out there? Okay, that's your actual, that's your filler material. That's what we're gonna add to the steel. So you can tell just by nature of this, you're not gonna weld something huge with that little tiny wire. Um, that's why something heavy duty like that stick welder, you can get those sticks, I think you can get them up to like 3 16 thick or something. I mean, so you can weld huge pieces of steel with the stick. You can weld small pieces of steel with this. I don't even think you really wanna go over eighth inch with this. Sometimes it's actually written on the side, um, what you can actually get away with. Um, which that's a good segue here. You know what Evan was talking about, setting the amperage? Um, on every welder I've ever seen, there's a chart that comes with it um, where if you're totally in the dark you, with what you're welding, say you want to weld a two quarter inch pieces of steel together, you know, then you can look at the chart and you can set your amperage and your, your speed according to the chart. And that's always a good place to start. It's not always perfect. You know, in every situation, you might need to speed it up for some reason. You know, so that's something you'll learn with experience too. Point is, start with the chart. This is what we're talking about. Wire speed, if I press that button, it's either slow or it's really fast. Fast. How fast it's feeding out of there. It, how fast it feeds out of here. And that's a function of how fast you're ready to move once you get it going. It's also how fast you need it to come out. If you're welding something heavier, you just need more material. Um, and you can set the voltage on these really cheap ones. You can only go high or low. Ours is stuck on high already. So um, that's fine. We would never go low. There's nothing around here that we need to, you know, weld low. Um, so in this case, the flux on a flux core wire is a little more expensive than regular MIG wire. MIG wire is a piece, it's just like a wire, a solid wire. Flux core actually has that little bit of flux on the inside of the wire. So it's like a little tiny hollow tube um, that deposits flux as you go, right? So when you're doing that, you're actually getting a, a little cloud of burnt flux, whatever that stuff is. You'll see that this thing's really fumy, kind of gross. Um, your welds are a little bit uglier, maybe a little splatter. Now, that's not to say that you can make it look good with this. Um, it's just a lot harder to make something look good. Not gonna get the heat out of something like this. It's just, you don't have the power. It's, a, it's that 120 volt plug, you know, um, versus the uh, big machine that we've got set up over here. Um, so, point is, you always, you're gonna have a flux whenever you're welding, you, you need to have a flux. Um, even the old-timey blacksmiths who can, who can weld on the forge, they can take two pieces of steel and heat them up super hot and then just bang them together right there on the anvil, and it's mystifying. But even they're using some sort of a flux. Um, if you remember back when I said something about wrought iron being self-fluxing, that's the exception. Wrought iron has something going on there that actually gives it this sheen look that actually protects it from oxidizing when it's hot. Any questions about this little guy? I'm getting ready to demo it. When you uh, you talk about flux and then gas, well, like which, which one comes out stronger? Or are they the same? Uh, the weld wise, yeah. I mean, I think this is going to be equally as strong if you stay within its limits. You know, you can take that other machine and you can dial it down. You know, so that you can weld small stuff with it. Um, I don't think strength is the issue so much um, as this just. Usually, I, you know, I haven't seen any really high-powered flux core welders. Our other welder actually can become a flux core. Um, and, you know, the, reason why, the only reason why we would run that as a flux core is um, 
this is unique to MIG welders, is in a windy environment. So I didn't, actually, I didn't tell you about the other welder. If, and I think we actually have the wrong tip on this because the flux core welder tip looks different. This is a, is a MIG welding tip. The wire comes out the middle, and what ha happens on the outside, and I'll show you this on the other machine, is it actually forces a shielding gas. It's like an argon. It's an inert gas. This is a high pressure gas that actually creates that cloud around what you're welding. Um, that doesn't work so well in really windy environments. Flux core you can use like in a hurricane. I think you're going to be okay. You know, um, that was a good question. Poor surface prep, like Johnny said, that stuff cannot be stressed enough. You got to see, you got to see bare metal if you really want to get a good weld. You got to get past it. And you might think that this is bare metal, but that's not bare metal at all. This is, uh, I think. And I might be wrong here, that's a hot rolled piece of steel. So when it's hot rolled, that's just the manufacturing process. It means it's been heated and it's got a thin scale on it, right? Looks yeah. kind of blue. Yeah. Um, kind of like a, a satin finish there. Mm -hmm. That needs to get ground off. Um, it looks clean, but it's, it's not. Um, you kind of need to see, as a rule of thumb, just get bare metal every time. Um, you need to know what you're welding. Um, I say, you know, I've included this never weld to a tank because people, I don't think when they say never weld to a tank that they mean don't weld to this tank, but uh, people have actually done that. Um, I've seen them. I've seen them at the junkyard where um, somebody will actually weld like a little pin or something to their tank so they can rest their hoses on the pin. I mean, I guess you can do it without, you know, blowing yourself up, but... Um, don't, don't try. Why would you do that? Um, some people, you know, say this tank, you know, this is, again, this is, we know this is a well tank because somebody gave it, it says it's a well tank right on the side, but we don't know what somebody else might have done with this tank before we got it, you know, bleed the pressure off, know what's inside of it before you go welding on it. Um, that's, you know, pretty important. We got some tanks from the junkyard. Um, these tanks, they're sweet. I mean, they're so nice. They're incredibly heavy wall. They're like 3 16ths in some place. Um, you know, I don't know what that was. This is a fire extinguisher over here. You guys probably can't see that. But point is, I mean, go like really slow. Um, if you ever want to weld on something like that, this is just a little tip. Um, get, a, get everything out. You'll see, we made some stuff out of propane tanks. I'll show you that, old forklift tanks. And this is really important. Um, Cause some gases are actually heavier than air and they'll settle down to the bottom. And they ne never actually bleed out of there unless you force them out. Um, that old propane tank, I took it and we took all the fittings off and then we fill it with water and then we displace whatever might be in there. Um, obviously we're not gonna go willy nilly and just weld onto anything that's closed without letting off any kind of, you know, needs a pressure relief on it. Too little or too much shield gas, that's an issue with the MIG welder, I'll show you that. Um, that's kind of similar to what Evan was talking about. If your electrodes are wet, not even wet, like if they're exposed to like this humidity, they'll be damaged. It's crazy. Um, the big guys like keep their electrodes in an oven and actually keep them warm or like a dehumidification chamber or something. Uh, improper settings on the welder, improper selection of wire. Um, Sometimes, and this is something I'll admit that I don't honestly have a really good feel for, sometimes it's better to actually push the bead than it is to pull the bead. I'll explain what that means um, when I actually demo the welds. Um, sometimes your metal might just be too far gone that it's not even worth welding. We get that issue a lot on this machine because we're dealing with some kind of high acid environment sometimes. Um, that we're actually kind of wearing our metal out from the inside out. You got to have two pieces of relatively high integrity to be worth welding. Johnny's going to work this cutting station. We're going to pull this out kind of away from the kiln a little bit. Johnny can demo the plasma cutter if anybody wants to see it. I can show you safe operation of the tools. Most of this stuff is loud and uh, shooting sparks. Obviously, it's not going to shoot sparks at you, but stand back. 
And we've got safety glasses. Evan's gonna show you how to stick weld way over there in the back. We've only, we got two welding outlets on opposite ends of our little station over here. And I'll show you MIG welding right there by the office. Y'all ready to start seeing it? Making sense of it? <laughs> yes.